All right, so I'm very, very, very excited to kick off our summer of emerging tech experts because we're Angular developers and we want to know what's going on with Angular, but also we want to know kind of what's going on. There's a lot of things that we need to know about, especially when we're scaling these huge applications. And so I have a bunch of really exciting uh, experts lined up um, for the next few weeks. And we're starting out today with Adam Bradley, I'm very excited. And I'm actually going to uh, let Saunder because, so this came up, the reason I summoned, I don't even know Adam. I'm like, hey, Adam, will you come and talk to us? And I've heard that he's very cool. Um, but I went looking for him because Saunder, you guys know Saunder. Saunder's basically the godfather of Angular Nation, right? And he was telling us about this thing, Party Town, that's brand new, uh, that he said it was very cool. And so I just think it's cool because Saunder thinks it's cool. So uh, so I asked Adam to come and talk to us about this. So Saunder, can you tell us just real briefly, and Adam's going to go into a little bit more detail, but can you just, just briefly tell us why Party Town is cool? Why should we know about this? Well, Party Town is really cool because the aim is getting all your third party scripts that are that you need to load in your page, but that are not essential to your applications into a worker out of the main thread. That's the correct short version, I think, Adam. Yeah, yeah, no, that about sums it up. Basically, uh, you want to get uh, all the, the stuff that isn't under your control, but you still need to have that on your page. That can be, you know, it's not doesn't need to be running as fast. It's not the main application like your Angular application. Throw that into a web worker to kind of like free up the resources for your application rather than all of the third party scripts that you inevitably have to add to your page. Yeah, the, the things for advertisements, uh, your Google Tech Manager, uh, Facebook, social. I would see scripting, but I don't feel that it is, should be called scripting. But OK, let's keep it on scripting. So it's a really, really cool helper that gets you, gets you free resources in your main thread, which is utterly important. And while we, we are talking on uh, on performance and scaling, um, I learned a couple of things this week, um, mainly a couple of new CSS techniques that are going to save also a lot of CPU cycles because you don't have to do uh, a boatload of uh, JavaScript for scrolling, for dialogues, and for uh, CSS layering. CSS layering is the new cool kid in town. Go look it up. It's out of scope <laughs> for this meeting. But it is. I was going to say, where are we going, Sondra? I thought we were doing party town. <laughs> no. We need to line up another topic for that for CSS learning. Especially, okay, we, um, we'll do that later on. But I have just, so much to talk about. It's going to be have a so cool much to summer. talk about. Okay, I see a hand up already, and I'm excited because uh, Tim actually runs a pretty large team. So, uh, Tim, you have a question? You have a comment? Do you know about Party Town? Uh, well, as soon as I saw the event, I started researching it. And uh, we use a third-party library called or script uh, Full Story, and I thought that might have been a perfect candidate. And I did see there were already some issues that uh, were posted back in May. Uh, I think it's gotten resolved since I've looked at it. Um, but that's one where uh, basically it records user sessions and other things. It's none of our code, so it would be great to get it out and get in a web worker. But I think because of some of the interactions, there were a little bit of complexities uh, using Party Town with it. But uh, yeah, I think that's funny you bring that one up because that's as specifically on my to do list. Because we also, <laughs> you know, builder.io, we also use Full Story. Okay. And so it's not just for like we want to make it work. It's like a, we actually would like to you know, free up the resources for our own application. Yes. Too. And so that's on my to do list is to look that one up. Um, I'd like to think that that one should be able to work. Um, cause it is kind of like asynchronous stuff happening in the background. Um, so I'm hopeful that, that we can off and it's also very, uh, resource intensive. So I'm hopeful that we can right. do that to a web worker instead. Okay. All right. Well, good. Then I'll, I'll keep following along. Cause you get that done. Then, uh, you have another customer for sure. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And on that, on that note, I'm going to quickly plug, you know, any sort of help that, you know, I can get, you know, it, from the open source community to, you know, assist of this, like, um, the biggest thing is like, yeah, um, you know, we don't try to actually, maybe I should just start from the beginning of kind of how Python works a little bit and kind of where I could really, you know, need help in testing, finding issues with, you know, this, this certain DOM thing, does it work? You know, how can I replicate the issue that, cause that certainly helps out a lot. Um, yeah, you and Sonder and Tim are farther ahead this conversation than all the rest of us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, we, should go, we should go back. Um, I, this, there, 
I don't is know. Is anybody right? else well, lost besides okay. me? <laughs> so, so let's start from the very, very beginning. Yeah, I'm good. I that is. I don't know where he is on your screen, but for me, he's, he's over there. Got the um, bunch. Yes. Yeah. We're just so excited, Adam. Yeah. Um, yeah. Welcome, everyone. That is Adam. Adam is has created Stencil. Probably some of you have heard of this. He is a co-author of, um, and I always, I'm so good with names. Sorry, Adam. Ionic. Yes, Ionic. Yeah. Uh, Ionic framework. I, I think I told you something about CSS that ended up in Ionic way, way back. More than likely. Yeah, I do remember having a lot of great conversations with you. I think it was NG Europe. Yeah. Um, yeah. Back in the day. Yeah. Basically, Adam's big time famous, you guys. <laughs> I don't know about that, but I I'm certainly <laughs> Nerd it, it, enjoy it, working in certain, on stuff. In certain circles, people know Adam. The so, people who know what they're talking about know who Adam is. So no, I that's should not go true because a lot of us know what we're talking about and don't know who that. That's not true. A lot of people don't pay attention to names at all, but but he's yeah. legit. You're legit, Adam. Um, okay, thank you. All right, so let me let me do like a, a high level uh, overview of Party Town. So basically, um, we all are worried about performance. We all want our application to work, no matter what application it is, whether it's WordPress, React, Angular. We all want our code to run as fast as possible. Um, and the, usually that's a big part of what our job is. Um, and then once you get your page running as fast as possible, somebody else, maybe yourself, maybe someone else in the, another team, uh, some sort of department has to have all sorts of third party scripts added also. So it's, uh, I think many, you know, developers in their career will get a, you know, lighthouse score of 100 out of 100, really proud of their score. The next time you look at it the next day, you see that, uh, somehow a whole, you know, 20 different scripts have been added to it too for. Uh, third party analytics such as tracking, um, you know, advertisements, things like that. Stuff that basically you need to have on your page. You know, I'm not going to argue. You know, like sometimes people say, "Well, just remove them." I'm like, well, that's just not um, that's not practical. You know, businesses need to have to collect that data. You need to make business decisions. So more than likely, you you need to have that uh, third party scripts on your page. The downside is uh, many of them get added to your page, and they're entirely out of your control. Um, they're large, large scripts that take up a lot of resources. So that fast application that you're really proud of that you had going quite well quickly gets diminished because somebody else's scripts are running. Um, and so that's where kind of Party Town steps in is that it wants to try to offload a lot of those third party scripts onto a web worker. And um, by doing so, that means that then the main thread, the, the main application that you're running in can, can again get back to that 100 score. And then somebody else's uh, code that is allowed to run a little bit slower runs inside of a, a different thread on your on your users' computers, and so um, by doing so, that basically speeds up your site. Um, and so I can certainly go into how that works, uh, but like I can just stop there if like any questions that that you have at this time. I just want to show real quick while you're talking about that the um, the picture that's on your that's on sure. your homepage because it's really cool. Yeah, and this just kind of shows that, like, you know, traditional on the left-hand side here, um, you're all in the main thread, the, the single thread where the browser's at, and everyone's kind of fighting for the same CPU of, I want to do this, I want to do this, I want to do this. And so uh, it's all just kind of, there's only so much you can you can take. Whereas the idea with Party Town is, you know, main thread is entirely your application. All the other stuff can run a little bit slower inside of the web worker. And so essentially trying to make your app faster in the end. So... There is this point where you need to run some things async and they are seemingly sync. How does that trick work? Yes, so that was that's this is the big trick. So like um, web workers have been around for you know a decade now, and so it's very obvious. So like why haven't we been doing this always, right? If if everyone can use a web worker, and so it really comes down to no matter what you do, going between the two different threads, there's an asynchronous uh, like moment between the two. So if you want to talk from one thread to the other one, you need to do a post message, which is perfectly fine. Um, there's many solutions that do that. If you have something extremely CPU intensive, you probably should already be doing that anyways. Um, certainly possible. The problem is that third party scripts often have uh, a synchronous blocking task. So the simplest one would be like document.cookie. You, you know, their code so you use document.cookie and they expect a string in return. Um, now, if you want to do that in a web worker, in the traditional sense, you would need to have a callback or uh, some sort of um, system for a promise 
or async await, something would need to say like, hey, I want the cookie, async await that, it gets a response. Um, and so that's how you would do it today. And so if you wanted to do it that way, we would then have to go to all of the millions of services out there and ask them to rewrite their entire code base, which basically isn't going to happen. Um, so I can't just call up Google and say, hey, you're doing it wrong. You need to rewrite all of your code, uh, including Google Analytics and the billions of dollars, trillions of dollars that are going through it just as we're speaking. So um, the realistic uh, fact is that we can't rewrite third-party scripts code, but we want to run them in the web worker. So we, and the web, and their code is going to be blocking. Their code is going to you know, expect, get attribute is going to immediately expect a value versus get attribute async await for the value. Um, and so this is where Python, this is a trick that Python actually does provide is that even though it's inside of a different thread and you have to do an asynchronous uh, post between the two, it applies a basically a trick that allows to freeze the web worker for a moment, get the asynchronous, uh, get the value from the main thread, such as, you know, document that title, get attributes, something like that, and then respond back to the web worker so it can continue to, to, to read that value. So the code that was ran inside the web worker has no idea that it actually isn't on the web on the main thread and it can continue to work exactly how it's coded. So we don't have to ask the millions of services to rewrite their code. We can just run their code inside the web worker and we can apply this trick to, to allow it to be blocking for certain moments of when it's trying to, to gather synchronous data. I don't know if that's, does that, does that kind of help about how it works um, and why like I'm, Let's let's go through what other questions we have at this before we go any farther. Pavel, we were just talking the other day about your app with the performance, and we were looking at your, um, you know, the network tab when it was loading all that stuff, and you had that. What was it? NGX Google Analytics that was like waiting, and everything's waiting for that. That's probably yeah that might be a that, good thing for you to look at. Yeah, I just Google it. Oh uh, no, just Google it. Uh, show me uh, looking into documentation and. Uh, looking just right in the Google Tech Manager, how can I load it with party time? <laughs> so yeah. you, you hit the point right now. And I am just is, looking on is, it right now. Yeah. Remember, this is the thing that I'm teaching all my architects is a proof of concept is just a hello world. So that means if you just take a branch and then go and just like try, because party town's in beta, right, Adam? Yeah, because there's... Um... There's basically, I don't want to say, you know, apply like Amazon.com. They're not going to apply it to the homepage and all of a sudden analytic breaks. And so there's lots of yeah. like uh, making sure that certain APIs uh, work exactly how they're expected to work. Yeah. And there are literally millions of scenarios, you know, billions of scenarios out there that we need to make sure work. And so that that's the big part of the, I guess why I'm calling it beta now is to make sure that we are, um, I don't know if emulating is the right word, you know, so something like JS DOM, which, you know, uh, Node.js doesn't have the DOM, doesn't have window or document inside of Node.js. And so JS DOM goes in and it replicates everything, rewrites how the browser works entirely, um, rewrites, you know, if you do get attribute, what would what would happen inside of the browser? And so it's like a basically a rewrite of the entire DOM. Now we could have done that, but then we would have had, you know, at least a two megabyte, you know, file to rewrite how the, how, you know, the browsers work. And that kind of would have completely defeated the purpose. And so a large part of what PartyTown is doing is that it's basically trying to be entirely hands off of like, what would the browser do? It just rather always forwards over the question to the main thread of just like document that cookie, you know? And so the web worker is like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Let's go to the main thread and ask what document that uh, title that cookie is. It gets the correct value and returns the string. And so that's really what it's doing is that we're really PartyTown is just a fancy proxy. Right, that allows things to be synchronous and just like any sort of question that's asked of, that, of something it doesn't know, such as a document or window information, it's always going to the main thread to get the real value and then response to it. And so um, that's the that's the part that we just need more testing with of when you with a certain like Google Analytics has got all sorts of code within it. Um, and I think Google Analytics is working quite well. Um, but if there's a certain scenario, like I think a, there was some usage of like media list you know, which is a rarely used value inside of the, inside of the DOM, but you know, something like that, you know, any usage of media list would then crash the web worker because it like, what are you talking about? And so that's where that's, that's why it's beta is because, um, you know, I'd hate to tell everyone just start using it today. It's going to work great. So we just need to find more scenarios, more, more tests, um, you know, recreate this problem. And then we solve that problem with Paritown. Um, 
And that's why I was asking earlier, you know, uh, you know, any sort of help we can get of you're like, Hey, I tried using uh, Google analytics and it didn't work. You know, like, well, how can you recreate that? What's, what's the one thing of why it crashed and then we'll make that work. And it's not going to be like, if Google analytics do this, it's rather like, why did this one Dom operation not work? Let's solve that. And so if we're making all of the DOM operations work, basically, you know, we're, we're able to correctly proxy everything. Then that means that all, you know, in theory, JavaScript should work. And so that's where we're trying to go with right now. This is where I really love having these conversations. It's like with Tim saying, I wanted to work with this. And then he meets you and you go, yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> and it's so yeah, beautiful yeah. to have those conversations. And I'm trying to tell the architects um, cause I do architect training and that's one of the things is if you, if you're looking at something and you're not sure if it's going to work for you, that's what a proof of concept, that's part of being an architect is trying out different things and you need to try it out before you can commit one way or the other. So that's why I'm saying Pavel, like you could just go make a branch, try out party town, play with, you don't want to like go and introduce it to the whole team and say, we're going to use this, but just try it out, play with it because it might actually solve the problem that you're having. And now that you know Adam, if you have questions along the way, then you're going to be more comfortable because you know that he wants feedback if you if you run into problems along the way. Yeah, and we have so a pretty active beautiful. Discord too. Um, you know, so we encourage you know everyone. The best thing is to create like the, the most minimal example of like I you know I tried using uh, full story and I got this error. If you can just boil it down to just like well, it's because of this one little thing it tried to, to do. You know, if you can recreate that one little thing inside of a unit test. Um, then we can fix it. That makes it a lot easier. And so that's where it's like, I love open source help, you know, because there's many, many different scenarios. And so the more like little tiny issues that can be uh, really PRs and issues that can be added, uh, the better it is for all of us. And I also really love to see, like, I want you to show me uh, and, and, you know, I'm always encouraging everybody to do tech talks and we're about to open up our community channels again with the CFP. I know it's taking forever, but Oye is helping us beta test it. We were just working on this today. Uh, so we're going to be opening up the community channels for CFPs. And this is the thing that I'm talking about with emerging technology, because when I first got my teeth into Angular, it wasn't that popular and it was brand new and everybody thought it was weird, but I loved it. And I just like really embraced it. And then later when it took off, I was an expert. And everybody thought I was cool, right? So if you embrace emerging technology and it ends up being like the next big cool thing, then everybody's going to be like, wow, Pavel told us about that like six months ago. And now here everybody's talking about it. So that's really part of being on that cutting edge. And not everything that we try is going to work out. So we don't want to just jump right into it and say, this is going to be the best thing. But absolutely to be the first one kind of playing with it and being like, okay, let's try this. Let's see. Because remember, why did we start this whole? Because Saunders excited. Now, you know, if Saunders excited about something, then it's probably cool, y'all. So, and if it's not perfect yet, that's fine because that's like the, the whole attitude of Angular Nation. Like none of us are perfect, we're a mess. So we just try it out and then give Adam feedback and then, you know, but it seems to be a pretty solid idea according to the godfather over there. <laughs> Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, blame it on me. Yeah, we do. Hey, Adam, hey, Jay. Hello. Uh, I was just curious, uh, I've, I've read about Atomics, but I've never used them. Um, just wondering if you could uh, describe a bit about how they work and how you, how you use them in party Town. Yeah, absolutely. So so there's right now, party Town has two ways to basically pause the web worker so that the web worker can take a moment to get the asynchronous information from the main thread and then come back to web worker and let it continue. Um, and so the basically the default way that works for almost everyone right now is it uses a service worker trick where we're able to, um, you know, basically intercept a certain request. We can have a, a synchronous XHR request. Anyways, it's I'm going to the weeds of how it works. And that's one method. The other method, which I'd much rather have the world using is the atomics one, what Tom brought up. So atomics is a way to um, essentially also pause the thread, go get information, and then um, you know, once you get the information, continue with Atomics. And so that way actually produces a smaller build. It's actually 10 times faster to do that than the uh, service worker XHR uh, synchronous request way. Um, the problem is that it also requires a certain HTTP header to enable it. And in most cases, in almost everyone's case, if you enable it, your, your HTTP headers, something on your site's going to break. And so um, a practical site in production more likely cannot just enable atomics without something breaking. 
um, which is sad. It saddens me that this is the case right now. Um, and because you guys are pushing emerging tech too. Yes, I mean, so so it works great. I love Atomics. Um, and really, do you remember the, um, the Spectre vulnerability, if anyone's familiar with that? Um, really, this, this certain header to enable Atomics is because of the, that vulnerability, where there's like a timing attack can happen. Um, I'm no expert on the low level of how that works or how you can do a timing attack. But with Atomics, it did enable that. And so they basically, the browsers have kind of uh, uh, mitigated the, the security issues that could happen with Atomics by adding this header. And so um, that also then makes it harder for Ionic, or I'm sorry, not Ionic, uh, Paritown to use it. I don't know if that uh, helps answer it all, but like, I love Atomics, uh, much smaller, faster, um, actually, the the correct solution, I think, to the problem is Atomics. It's just that they're hard to enable in today's landscape. Yeah, yeah that's great. Thanks. Like, actually, Atomics is the JavaScript answer to memory locking. Yes. So, which wasn't possible before, but they needed it for Wasm anyway. So now we got it. Uh, available for JavaScript itself also, which is nice because sometimes you just need a way to lock things, especially if you want to fake sync stuff. Guilty. Yeah. <laughs> Aristides Pampacos. Adam, Aris is another one of our big uh, Angular experts. He's a GDE. He's the author of a couple Angular books. He's badass. <laughs> Thanks for the introduction. Hi, Adam. Nice to Thanks. see you here. Um, I, I went through the documentation for the HTML page, and it says that it can be used in any web page as long as the HTML is updated and the library scripts are hosted from the origin. So I was wondering, I, I doubt about that, but I was wondering if we can use it for um, services that uh, you can create your own web page, like Squarespace or Wix. Yeah, so at the lowest, lowest level, it was it was really important that um, it, I found it really important to make sure that how it worked had nothing to do with Angular, React, WordPress. Like there is no specific um, way that Python would work. It really is just a script element somehow has the type attribute of text slash Python. Um, and so however that attribute got put on there, whether it was with Angular or with WordPress or Drupal, we don't care or is hand coded, then Python is going to work. And so um, that's why really there, uh, we have some integration guides on the website. Um, they're really just like helpers to make Python work. And so um, as far as other services, so like if you have Wix and um, you're using uh, Google Analytics inside of Wix, however you would write that script in Wix, you just it would add the type uh, script type equals text slash Python. Um, to enable that. And so, so um, short answer is yes, it, sh it should, air quotes, work with, uh, you can enable in almost any service. Any service that you can edit HTML, you can use uh, Python basically. I can see from the from the samples in the website that the script is added, the party town snippet is added in the head element of the page. And I'm, I'm, I think, I'm thinking that most of these services do not uh, give you access in the head element, but instead they somehow merge your um, your custom JavaScript file with theirs. Yeah, I guess that would depend on the service uh, of mm -hmm. however that would go. So like if they don't give you access to add a script, then yeah, I guess you, you wouldn't be able to, to do that. And I can talk a little bit about like how that script works. So like traditionally, um, a script element that whether it has a source or it's got inner HTML, um, when the browser sees script, it's going to imme immediately execute it, right? Uh, and so um, that's the other trick that Python does is like basically everything is identical. You can still add the script how you you always added it, um, but add the attribute of type text slash Python, which tells the browser of like basically the browser is like I've again I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm going to treat this as just some uh, hidden div and skip right over it. it. Has no idea. This isn't a script to me. I don't know how to execute it. So that's the way that you basically tell the browser, like, here's the information, but I don't want you to execute it on the main thread. And then later on, after your page loads, everything's really fast. Um, 
and everything is cooled down on the main thread, that's when part time kicks in. It's like, all right, let's find all those scripts that we already skipped over and let's get a copy of them and throw them over to the web worker and let's execute them over there. And so that's the big difference um, of how we're able to basically not run in the main thread, but also, but do run inside of a web worker. Awesome. Great. Thanks. Just skip right over the line. It's awesome. I was telling you, Eris was a big expert, but I should have also said Tom was an expert because uh, Tom's been around for a while and he's always asking very good questions. He's a smart guy. They're both really smart. Everybody's really smart. I love these people. This is great. Uh, does anybody else have more questions? Uh, there was something that I was looking at. Where was the website on the, um, is there, I'm just curious because I, I, I always love to see it working, right? Do you have demos? There's integrations, but I don't see an integration for angular. Does there, is there one coming? Um, this is where I'm going to plug the community to help me out with one. Um, cause really the, I think I've been asked before for the angular integration and really the, the HTML integration is the best one. Um, and I think there is actually a PR to add it to uh, add the Angular integration. Um, but that was way before a handful of refactorings that, you know, it's it's drastically different that we weren't able to use that PR. Um, and I want to try to keep it as simple as, as possible. And so this is where I'd love, I'm going to plug again for any help from the Angular community, uh, whether it's really just to, uh, you know, update the doc site. Uh, I think like you just do it. I think if you load Polyton before you load zone JS, you're golden and you can just use the script trick in your HTML. So yeah, we don't so really just... need an Angular integration really? No, because really it has nothing to do with Angular. It is about loading scripts that you have to load to sideload alongside your application anyway. You're not loading Angular stuff. You are loading things like the Google Tag Manager. You are loading stuff for, um, Locking and tracking, you're loading stuff that is actually running alongside your Angular application. So it is not, you don't really need any Angular, Angular integration. The, the only thing is that uh, we might add a directive to lazy load some additional stuff, but I wouldn't know what you want to load later on in party town. But you know what would be really cool is because I hear a lot from developers who are trying to kind of, you know, get more into um, more career opportunities. They want to get into open source. They want to kind of network more in the community and get, you know, a little out of their comfort zone. And a lot of people really want to do baby steps into open source. And they don't really know how because most of us are very introverted, right? That's why I'm such a goofball because I'm trying to get y'all to come and turn your cameras on. So I'm just saying, if you're here or if you're watching this and you're not really participating but you want to you could basically just open a pull request for party town for the docs and put exactly what saunder just said because even if we don't actually because i agree i don't think that we need like all of this you know all this extra stuff if we don't need it so it's always better to keep it simple but on the part i'm going to show you i'm going to show you Pavel, I'm going to come on you in just a minute. Uh, I'm just going to show them this real quick, and then I'll come to your question. Because look here, if um, if we had see where it says, hold on, see where it says in the in the sidebar the integrations. We've got React in there, right? We've got all these, but we don't have Angular. So what Saunders saying is we don't really need Angular. We we could just go to this page, right? But if it had Angular here, it would be even more welcoming for the Angular developers who are kind of looking at Party Town skeptically, like, should I check this out or not? Like, we would want to make them feel welcome. So it would be really easy, right, Adam, to open yes. up a pull request and just and, and just make a page for Angular that says what Sonder just said. So yeah, easy, y'all. And, and probably, most of those integrations. Sorry, actually, you should repeat my words, not, not put that, what Sonder just said. Yeah, yeah. You actually have to type <laughs> what Thunder says. Right. <laughs> but you could put that into a PR and then it would yeah. and then and then if it gets merged in, because then now you just because Adam doesn't have time, right? He's working on other stuff. But if something like that could be simple and then you will forever be a part of the party town repo. And then you know, it could be like huge and famous and, and big, and then you'll be an early adopter, an early contributor. There's also, 
it's also really helpful because, you know, I don't have a large scale Angular application on my computer this second. You know, I don't have a Shopify Hydrogen and React. You know, so there's so many different scenarios, and it takes a lot of time to try to get the the use case that everyone else is in right now. So for someone that is, you know, does have a, a very large uh, Angular application, they knew how it was best to integrate it. So having their words describing what's the best way to integrate it inside of an Angular 14 app, uh, it's much preferred than me trying to guess what it what's the best way right now. Well, you know, if we use Party Town with Angular, then at that point, everything that happens is your fault after that. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> you know the rules, Adam. <laughs> yes. He, he has worked on Stencil and he has worked on Ionic. So yeah, he knows the rules. Yeah. <laughs> Whenever you when provide was... a third party thing, whatever breaks comes up on you somehow. <laughs> When I was younger, yep. I was a single mom and I had a really old car and I tried to take it to a mechanic and they said, your car is so old that we don't want to work on it at all because we're afraid that you'll blame us for whatever happens next and we just don't want to touch it. I was like, okay, fine, <laughs> fine. So, okay, yeah. so. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, one, one, one last plug is, so anyone listening that has integrated or wants to or wants to contribute, please, you know, you know PR would be awesome. I'd love that. Merged. <laughs> And I would also love to see when the, when the uh, community talks start back up again. I love for people, like if you're, because I, I I'm always encouraging people to do technical talks and they don't like, I don't know what to teach, right? Well, and a lot of people say that, I don't know what to teach. Well, if you're teaching something that's brand new, it's, you know, it's pretty, it's a pretty good topic. And, uh, and, and really just to do, because um, we did this when uh, when Peter Bacon Darwin was here and he was talking about generators and we were like we really need like a demo somebody go do a demo and show us but he didn't have time and so now Oye is doing a see our students is asking the same thing is there a demo um, is there a demo is there like a hello world on the website Adam yeah there is maybe I can share um, my screen here and just yeah. go through the the website because I would also like to have somebody from the community actually do a hello world and show us and do like a little talk, a little presentation. And you know what's cool? I'm pretty sure that if you wanted to put together a talk about Party Town, just to kind of show it off and show like a little hello world, if you got stuck along the way, probably Adam would be more than happy to help you to make sure that, that everything's working yes, for you. Absolutely. So it's a win-win. We did this with Anna Boca and the Cypress team. She was putting together a Cypress talk and she was like, I'm trying to do it. And then we were like, Anna, the Cypress team is going to help you. And they did. And it was great. You're sharing your screen, Adam? Yep. Can you see, can you share my, or see my screen now? Yep. Yes. I see Google. OK, great. Uh, great. Um, you see the Party Town website? Yes. No. OK. So, um, so we do have some examples of how it works. So these end-to-end -end tests here, these are the actual tests that we use Puppeteer. So Puppeteer is a way that we could run you know, actual tests inside of a browser. It's a great project. I love it. Um, but you can also go to these same, uh, these same tests and see like the different, um, see like basically how it's working. So like in this case, I'm replicating every single different uh, how you would use document, so document dot get element by ID, things like that. And um, I run the test inside of here and expect a certain value to happen so that uh, uh, it would work. And so if we look at the network tab here and let's refresh it. Um, so this is using, oh, this is using Atomics. Um, let me use a different one. So you don't see those in the network tab. Um, let's, let's try a different test here. There's actually a, services test um let's do tag manager and refresh that sorry i'm failing to get a good demo i'm gonna go back to the um and edit test so let's do something simple anchor the different ways we can use anchor and so if you can see the view source here, this is where this again, this is basically just an end-to-end an -end test that we have of like, say that this is a script of a third-party script, and this is what they're doing. Um, what we have is this code is inside of the, the script type text slash party town. And so this is what I was describing before is like when a browser sees a script, it's like, what are you talking about, man? 
and just skips right over it because it has no idea this is not a script to me. So I'm not going to try to execute it. And that's because this type text attribute is not a recognizable thing. But then later on, the web page, um, the Python is going to load and it's going to scan your document for like, all right, which one are you guys, do you want to execute into a web worker? And it goes through, finds this text, and then moves it over to the web worker and executes the exact same code. Um, and then the biggest, like the hard part would be something like this get attribute, right? So like here we, um, we created an element, okay? Which again, you know, document is a global that's inside the web worker and the web worker has no idea what a, what a document is. And so we create this proxy of basically, um, I'm a global, but I don't really know what to do. So when you call create element, um, I also don't know what that is. Let's just forward document.createElement over to the main thread to see what they know what to do with that. Um, and it comes back up, you're like, oh yeah, this is, it created a node. And so then here it's the same thing. And the node has these properties on it. And so then it goes ahead like, okay, so let's, let's assign this string to it. It's a setter here. Um, and then let's get the attribute from it. So then same thing, it's able to like, um, I have no idea what, what a node is. I don't know what good attribute is. Let's go ask the main thread what, what it knows and it responds. And so inside of here, um, it's going between the web worker and the main thread two or three times um, to talk. And so that's why I say like uh, the scripts that you run inside of a web worker are going to be a touch slower than if they were in the main thread. But you also can see that as a feature because you, if they were um, eating away your resources, you want them to be somewhere else um, going a bit slower. And, and really, it's great for something like Google Analytics, where uh, most third-party scripts are, are in asynchronous nature, right? They, they listen for clicks. Um, they listen for any sort of user events. And then they post that information to a service. And so all of that is asynchronous, and it can happen in the background. Like, you want to post that information using some sort of fetch on a different thread. You don't want to eat away the one that you're using um, at all. And so I don't know if this is helpful at all. Um, any questions at this point? I just want to remark how cool it is that this script is actually running inside of a worker and not inside of the main thread. Because if you glance on it, it's not that impressive. But this code is running inside a worker. The worker doesn't know about document. I think this is utterly cool. Yep, exactly. And, and we're, we're even, you know, um, emulating different windows um, too. And so like you yeah. can have many different iframes um, inside of uh, inside of the, the same web worker um and so it's not just like a big you know glob of all these different globals and things are going to step on each other it is being smart about like well actually this is a different window so this is a different context and so it's able to, to stay smart about that between like even iframes this is very cool so you've got this viable thing and now you have to just open it up and just get all the use cases and start you know sorting through all the use cases and little everybody's got to break it so we can fix it Yep, exactly. And that's where that's where like, you know, even Canvas, right? Where even, you know, there's no no way Canvas would work inside of a web worker. But same thing is like I'm able to draw these things inside of do all the logic inside of the web worker and then just apply it onto the main thread. Um, and so that's what these tests do. Or basically um, I'm not writing code to do exactly what the to do what the browser would have done. I'm not doing you know JS DOM, but rather like making sure that things correctly forward to the main thread. And so if you come across something inside of your third-party script you're trying to enable and you get some error of just like, this isn't possible. Um, again, like boiling it down to one of these tests inside of here or making a new one, like let's say um, something inside of Navigator doesn't work, like use, user agent, we wanna make sure that we can get that information correctly. Actually, in this case, uh, user agent is available inside of the web worker. Um, so that's, this is actually one case where it's actually kind of slick, but oddly enough, Send Beacon is not. I just want to remind everybody about something and I won't speak for Adam because I just met Adam today, but uh, I know because I've been around in the community in the open source community for a while, for a while. And I will say over and over again, there's something that I see that some new cool thing comes out. A lot of people are not paying attention. This happened with Angular big time because everybody thought, oh, that was, no, they weren't paying attention. But um, when it starts to take off, and same thing with stack blitz, same thing with AG grid, right? Then it, then it all of a sudden it's cool and everybody wants to love it. And then they get funding and then they start hiring a team, which Adam's not there yet because this is a brand new cool thing. But you know what happens when they get funding? 
where do they look first when they're hiring them? from their own community, from the people that were starting early on? Because a lot of the people who were hired from the Angular team were early contributors to Angular. A lot of the people who were hired for AG Grid were early contributors to AG Grid. So I'm just saying, y'all, I'm just saying, it could be good for your career, but I'm not speaking for, I'm just speaking from like what I've seen from other projects like this, that it's, it's, it's the early, everybody's like kind of playing with it and then whew, suddenly they have money to spend and where do they go? Yeah, we'll say just we'll say like um, my experience with Ionic and even Stencil is uh, a lot of um, you know the people that worked on it. A lot of the people that are employed by Ionic today are largely the ones that showed up in the, the GitHub issues. You know, people that stuck out as uh, oh yeah, like how would that work? You know, this is a great PR. You know, and it went over and over again. You know, that's where um, <laughs> certainly the first people we contact. Yeah, for sure. Go ahead, Ari. Um, is um... Is part of time used in Quick Dev or Builder.io? Yes. So we use it on the homepage of um, Builder.io, and the homepage of Builder is also with Quick. And so um, it really actually, I mean, the reason part time even existed was to kind of complement Quick because it all came down to is like, yes, we can, you know, like everyone's story, we can make the exact, you know, the fastest framework in the entire world. But then the second we add, scripts to it or back to 50 or 30 or, you know and so that was like okay we can solve this problem but it's only half the problem and so like well how can we how can we solve the other part of third-party scripts and, and this really is kind of a solving it for our customers type of thing um so again part time is open source uh, you don't need to be a customer or builder at all but we do have many customers that have this exact problem where they um they make a fast website um but darn it i'm still i you know i have an e-commerce site and it's still slow why you know like why is it so it's like well it's because you've got 20 different you know 500 kilobyte scripts that are all fighting for resources and so that's where i like that's where we kind of sat back it's like okay we need to solve that problem for them too and that's kind of where part down came from okay isn't that the way yeah. go ahead Ari. yeah well, th thanks for the answer yeah say that's the same thing that uh eric said about stack blitz because and and i think that's the same thing mishka said about angular he was solving a problem for himself yeah and then he was like i might as well share this yeah that's right that it was basically angular forms so designers could build forms a lot faster that's where angular came angular js came from uh islam you had a question yeah uh, i don't know if you if you used uh, lottie files before but it's it's uh, it's a web player the for, for playing animations and stuff, Int and it integrates with with the script tag and is it is it a valid use case for uh, Party Town? Like, um, I guess it you know the answer with any uh, any software question is like it depends. <laughs> um, so I've, I've found that most background type task stuff is great for Python, um, stuff that's very UI intensive where it's doing many, many different, like, you know, like a, like an SVG library that's going, you know, hundreds, thousands of DOM updates, every, you know, request animation frame, that'd be a, you know, not an ideal one because that means there's so much like, cause basically any, any message between the web worker and the main thread is two to three milliseconds on a good day. Um, could be, you know eight milliseconds. And so if you consider every single one of those uh, for all of your thousands of, you know, update attribute, you know, or set attributes, um, then that's where it's not ideal. Um, and so, but if it's doing a lot of logic, like if it's doing a lot of logic and then does a couple, a handful of, uh, you know, DOM updates, then that's where part sounds great for it um, because okay. it can do the logic into a different thread. And so we do have, you know, as far as I know, um, a lot of SVG animations, you know, a lot of the different libraries. I think I even have, uh, I forget which charting library I tested with, whether it was high charts or whatever, but I, I know that's been working um, just fine with Pirate Town. Um, so really it depends, like what's, how many DOM updates are you doing every request animation frame? Um, if it's thousands, it's probably not good. If it's one, it's probably fine. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it's especially useful for the CPU intensive uh, third party scripts where they are doing a boatload of calculations or going back and forth to their own servers that is holding up your main thread. Uh, putting those yeah. in a walker really saves up uh, 
boatload of resource for your main thread, which is really, really useful. But if there is a is there a, if there is an enormous amount of the DOM interaction, it's probably slower. Yeah, and, and the other big uh, benefit to Python is is even the startup time. Um, <clears throat> when you have just one, like even just even just Google Analytics, it only you know dings your performance just a little bit. But again, when you have twenty, which isn't that far fetched, and each one is three hundred kilobytes of code, and then it just has to you know parse that and execute that immediately, and all twenty of you are having to fight for how fast it can do that. That's where Python can can improve your startup performance drastically is that all of those scripts didn't have to be evaluated and downloaded on the main thread, but all that can happen in the web worker instead. And so that's, that's probably another big benefit of Python is, is kind of your startup time. Go ahead, Pavel. That's a good question you're asking. I just want to ask about if you try to implement the Google Maps or some library which is using the maps. Like you said before, it, it is has a problem with SVG or Canvas. <laughs> so it, if it would be better to not use it or maybe try it with party I want to I want to guess, Adam, and you tell me if I'm right or wrong, because I think that Google Maps would be an example of something that's UI intensive that you're saying is what we want to avoid. That would be my guess. However, um, th this is one I yeah, it depends. Yeah. Try it because it might be well more CPU and uh, I/O intensive, and then it will be offloaded off the main thread. It will be a little bit slower by itself, but your your app as a whole might be a boatload faster. Yeah, it because that was back the <laughs> well, uh, I have been uh, searching about so many websites and they are mostly based products on like map or, you know, Google map and it was just, uh, it was nice to ask yeah. <laughs> and get the No, it, and the reason I say it way. depends, the reason yeah. I say it depends is like, um, we actually do batch a lot of like setters. And so if you, if you think of your code of just like, you know, style that color that red style color, you know background color blue you know you do all these sets that's not a that's not a uh, hop over to the main thread like it basically batches them all up and so if the google or google maps code is doing that like i want to build this canvas or i want to build this svg and it does it you know does a thousand different commands that's fine because the second it does a getter it's when it sh ships it all over to the to the main thread but if it's doing um set the value, read the value, set the value, read the value. Is it just keeps going back and forth? That's where it could be slow. And so, um, well, so maybe uh, the frozen Google Maps would be good. But if some users should uh, move with the map and trying to look the uh, zoom in yeah. or zoom out, it would be bad for performance. Yeah, it just it really yeah. just certainly depends okay. on how that code is written. Like if it again, like if it so does a whole bunch of individual. Sets one, yeah, <laughs> it's individual. Yeah. OK, yeah. thank you. Yep, that's a good question. Right. And that's oh, also yeah. the same thing, like, uh, you know, test it out, like, you know, submit the, so I do have like inter on the website, there's <clears throat> integration tests and we have the different services, you know, just add a minimal Google, Google Maps um, and see what happens, I guess. Also, it really depends if, if your application is on top of Google Maps, it probably is going to be worse. If you are using Google Maps to, to plot like a little chart for someone to see where the thing is, it probably is better in a in a party town walker. So if if you're if you're using Google Maps to, uh, for example, calculate distances or something, it because I think it provides this this kind yeah, of yeah, it, it totally does, and that is really CPU intensive. And again, it depends. You really should try your use case and and just benchmark it in the main thread and benchmark it in a party town thread. And just, um, I think it's just trying it and using it and see if it's sluggish or not. I think if you're trying to use Google Maps to calculate distance and you're doing that kind of off to the side and all you want is the actual distance, that would be a perfect way to use, because there's like, go over there and do that and just give me the answer and get out of my way. Yeah. Which would be, I think, perfect. Try it. Pavel, let us know how it goes, because now we all want to know what's going to happen. Back. Same thing with you as well. Yeah. Try it. Report back. Uh, Oya had a good question, and then Nevzat also uh, was looking at the docs and had uh, a good um, uh, comment about the Angular integration. 
Uh, Oye? Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you, Adam, for oh. this. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, so, Sandra, yeah, I remember you were saying uh, for Angular, the best scenario would be to put it outside of zone to load party town. I was like, how in simple terms would one be able to achieve that to do that? Load it before you load zone.js is the easy way. Um, if that's hard or impossible to do in your application, just uh, run the script using a run outside zone. You can grab the zone and be, then you have to... Would that be like like inside the main TS file to do something like that? Or how, how would that be implemented? Yeah. Okay. Do it in your main DS and there you can just import import party town before you import the zone JS. And that okay. should do it. And that's the that would be the okay. perfect, you know, advice that that I would love to get help with of uh, where should it go, you know, as an Angular developer, how do I how should I load this and why should it go in front of or uh, above the zone JS? So absolutely I'd love to get help, you know, documenting that so anyone can read that and know what to do. Yes. And Oye, I'm dropping a link to this uh, page, the docs, about where you would find that, what he said about run outside of Angular. Okay. It's in the docs. Okay, uh, Ari, I'm going to come to you in a minute, but I wanted to see, uh, if, uh, Nezvat, are you still, Nevzat, are you still here? Because that was a good comment that you had about, um, we need to have a good Angular integration because of the debug property. But you might be an introvert and you might not want to talk on it, but that's okay. But if you want to. Yeah, and I, I can just quick talk about the, the debug property. Is like, um, there's kind of two builds to um, Python. Uh, one is for production that just does everything as fast and small as possible. The other one is a debug where it's pretty loud of all sorts of uh, logs of like, I'm about to set this value. I'm like, I just read this value. So it, it logs a lot of information and that's what really helps you debug someone else's script, because really, you think about someone else's third-party script, it's uh, you know 300 kilobytes of minified code. You have no idea what it's trying to do. And so with the debug version, logging out everything that's about to happen, it can really help you track down why didn't it work. Or or really, it also can help you see like, hey, why are you even trying to access my user or user agent and things like that? And so it also helps you you know, figure out like, what are these third-party scripts doing? Which which is something that actually I haven't even talked about. I don't even think I've I mentioned enough on the doc side is that you can also deny, um, allow and deny certain calls. So like if you absolutely want no third-party script to access, let's say your cookies or your user agent or something like that, um, <clears throat> you can sandbox them all of just like, when someone asks for navigator.useragent, respond with an empty string. You know, like it's all, it's entirely up to you. And so I think it um, gives you a bit more power and, and you even can start to see like what are scripts doing and you can debug that with that version of, of like, what are they doing and why and where is it coming from? Um, Pavel was asking about problems with browser support and I was saying that browsers, that only atomics, right? Because some, not all browsers support atomics, but if the browser doesn't support atomics, then it will just fall back to the web worker. Yep. And so, um, so for someone like IE11, which was officially done on Wednesday, um, <laughs> but for a browser that absolutely does not have service workers, that's still also fine because our code knows that you don't have a service service worker. So it basically just runs the scripts the traditional way. It just does basically nothing. It just turns it back into a normal script um, for someone like IE11. And then um, everyone else that has a service worker or anyone that has Atomics available and it's enabled. So uh, the Python site actually does have Atomics enabled. And that's because it was easy for, because there's not too much to the Python site. Um, it does have it enabled. And so Python will see like, hey, Python is available. Let's run it with the Atomics build instead. Um, and then for everybody else, you know, it goes through those if statements and then gets to like, all right, let's do the service work away instead. And so uh, so my vague answer is like, yes, it should work in pretty much any browser in theory. If we go back to Nevzat's question about the debug mode, because uh, he was talking about being able to configure that debug property in different environments. Is that an option or is that on the um, roadmap? Yeah, and so that's where some of the integrations do, like the React integration. It's really just a JSX wrapper component that you can set the property of debug, true or false. 
but it's again it's just a wrapper what it comes down to is like well what's the url you want to request um and there's a there it's python.js or debug slash python.js and so um that's what that's where like again the docs would be helpful uh, an angular docs so we would say like if you want to use the debug version in in the while during doing development um we can have that presetting to make sure the the url it has the debug in the in the url that's awesome such yeah, good questions that's also easy to do inside of the main.ts you have to if if enable production mode and you just can load the different version if you want we yeah. now have like also top level await that makes it even easier you can just await the version you really want Await dynamic import and be done with it the other thing that um the doc certainly talk about but it's it's gotcha is that um because we're using service workers, service workers have to run on the exact same, same domain as your application. Um, so it's like a hard requirement that if you want to use Python, um, those, those scripts need to run from your domain. Uh, you can't use it through a CDN. If it's through a CDN and you're on a different domain, then the service worker is never going to kick in. It's never going to be able to intercept your requests. And so that's one restriction um, to be aware of. And then the other one, um, it's also got you is that certain certain uh, third party scripts don't have the cores headers that allow it to work inside of a web worker. Um, and so because of that, you can certainly proxy those and add the cores header yourself. But that's also kind of an nuisance. Um, and so those are kind of the two big things that can trip people up. Uh, Google Analytics does have the correct uh, uh, headers. Many do. But some of them don't, and because they don't need to, because they're in the main thread and they're added with a script element, and they've been fine doing that for the last 20 years, they don't have to add this course header. Um, and then Party Town comes in and say, hey, we're going we're to fetch it from the web worker. And that JavaScript fetch doesn't have the course header, and it crashes. And so um, the, the website certainly talks about like how the workarounds to do that, but that's something to be aware of. Uh, everybody come off mute and help me thank Adam for his time. Thanks, Adam. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Adam. You. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thanks, everyone.